All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the School Leadership Under ESSA State Highlights webinar being hosted by the National Governors Association and Council of Chief State School Officers and in partnership with the Wallace Foundation. I'm Seth Gerson, Program Director for K-12 Education at the National Governors Association. We have a great panel of governors, advisors, and state commissioners lined up today to share their knowledge and expertise with you on strategies for moving forward school leadership policies at the state level, and most specifically, insights on how governors and state education commissioners in Delaware and Tennessee have worked together to advance school leadership in their states. Before we move to introductions of the panelists, we'll first have staff of the NGA and CCSSO in the room introduce themselves. We'll first turn to Monica and Bryant at CCSSO. Thank you, Seth. Uh, hello, everybody. This is Monica Taylor, Senior Program Director for School Leadership and Continuous Improvement at CCSSO. And I am here with my colleague, Bryant Best, Program Associate in our School Leadership Group. All right, great. Thanks, Monica and Bryant. And here, NJ staff in the room. Hi, this is Sam Tangersley. Um, I am a policy analyst for K-12 education here at NGA. Hi, this is Alyssa Thibodeau. I'm a program assistant in the education division at NGA. Hi, this is Tiffany Ferret. I'm also a program assistant um, in the education division at NGA. Great. So we're excited for the panel and the conversation today. From Delaware, first, we have Secretary of Education Susan Bunting. Secretary Bunting was a longtime Delaware middle school educator and nationally recognized former superintendent of Indian River School District in Selbyville, Delaware, for more than 10 years. We also have from Delaware, John Sheehan, Education Policy Advisor for Governor John Carney. John is a former fifth grade teacher, and before joining Governor Carney's staff in 2017, John was Chief of Staff for the Division of Family and Community Engagement at the New York City Department of Education. And from Tennessee, we're honored to have Commissioner of Education Candace McQueen. Dr. McQueen has served as Tennessee Commissioner of Education since 2015. Commissioner McQueen is a former classroom teacher, and before being appointed Commissioner, Dr. McQueen served as the Senior Vice President and Dean of the College of Education at Lipscomb University in Nashville, Tennessee. Monica and I will be moderating a conversation with the panelists for approximately 40 minutes, and then we'll leave around 15 minutes for your Q&A. And before we start, I just wanna mention that all lines are muted, and to please save your questions until the end. When we open it up for questions, you can use the raise hand feature and we'll unmute you. Type your questions into the questions box or email education at nga.org. We're recording this session and we'll send it out to participants at the end. So let's dive in. Secretary Bunting, first question to you. If you could describe Delaware's efforts to improve school leadership, and specifically, how did you work with Governor Carney to move this work forward? I think first it's important to mention that more than likely, one of the reasons I was asked to be Secretary of Education was because of some of the work that I had been doing previously in developing school leaders, both through administrative development programs and then through leadership institutes with the existing, uh, the existing leaders, principals, assistant principals, and central office folks in the district where I was the superintendent. Since coming to the department, this has been a real belief of mine. Uh, I have espoused the, the major impact that a learning leader has on any particular school or on a school system. So it's something that I have strongly believed in. And as I reorganized the department and selected people to be associate secretaries who would be in charge of, for example, educator support, I was looking for a very strong leader to lead that initiative, one that had experience with mentoring and developing leadership. And we found that person. I'm very pleased uh, that he has done an amazing job already of organizing a huge campaign to develop leaders in the state. Uh, we're looking for uh, major results from our new administrative program that supports building leaders. We also have induction programs for assistant principals and principals. Uh, there's an aspiring leaders network that we've established and a principal preparation council. We also have a number of continuous improvement efforts such as a leadership advisory council that helps us decide what would be most effective in developing leaders. We want the people with the boots on the ground to be giving us advice. We have an annual leadership series that's being conducted. We hold job-alike meetings so that people can collaborate with those in similar positions. 
and we have a superintendent or a chief leadership style development series that's aligned with current theories uh, to develop a personalized organization kind of framework. So in our ESSA goal setting um, and review of what has happened in the year, I've actually started working with the superintendents from each of the 19 districts in the state of Delaware. We look at our ESSA goals, we set goals per district, and then I meet with them as a mid-year uh, evaluation kind of conference and also hold a summative evaluation with them, it's something that's very, very different to be dwelling on that data and the connection between the Department of Education and Chiefs is quite different. Uh, but I, I come from that Chiefs background and thought that this would be a way we could promote both leadership and our ESSA uh, goals. And um, we do meet regularly. Communication is a big thing in Delaware, and since we're such a small state, we can easily gather within an hour and 10 minutes. Anybody in the state can be here in the state capitol. So we do meet regularly with the Chiefs. And I believe in having the chiefs highly involved in developing the leaders within their individual districts. And then we're able to hold showcases to actually um, um, highlight what has been happening that's working. And we usually base that on the data that shows student progress. So those are just a few of the things that we're doing to improve school leadership in Delaware. That's great, and it's great to see how your superintendent experience has really informed the work you're doing now as, as Secretary of Education. John, similar question to you in terms of from the, the governor's lens, how has Governor Carney helped move this work forward? Yeah, thanks, Seth. Uh, so when Governor Carney was Lieutenant Governor back in the early 2000s, uh, one of his signature programs was called the Models of Excellence Program, and, and the, the theory behind it was quite simple. If you can partner uh, struggling schools up with higher performing schools, share best practices, create relationships, uh, we can hopefully see results from the, the lower performing schools. And one of the signature partnerships in that was between the principal of a lower performing school in the Wilmington area and a higher performing school, ironically, in, in Selbyville, where Dr. Bunting was the, the superintendent. And we paired this struggling principal up with a, a much higher performing school. And the results at the lower performing school were staggering. There was uh, significant progress. Uh, the principals visited one another often, exchanged best practices, talked about what's working, did a number of classroom observations. And over a few years, we saw tremendous growth at the, the lower performing school. However, when that principal who had been instrumental in that turnaround was promoted, like often happens, uh, Unfortunately, the school fell back into low achievement, high suspension rates, and, and is still struggling to this day. So that example left an in, in imprint in, in the governor's mind about the importance of a great school leader at the head of every building and that you really can't have turnaround and continued progress without a great leader at the head of the building. So as Secretary Bunting, Bunting mentioned, uh, when the governor was elected and was thinking about who to appoint as secretary. He appointed someone who has had tremendous success as a principal, but also as a superintendent, uh, hiring and developing principals. I think there were multiple state principals of the year under Dr. Bunting's leadership because of her investment in, in principal. So, you know, really cheap is, is to appoint someone uh, who knows this work, who knows what it takes, who believes in, in school leadership. And Secretary Bunting, as she mentioned, has reorganized at the governor's request the department to be more supportive to have folks like our associate secretaries who have been successful principals themselves and who come from, to, to what you mentioned, Seth, who come from districts and have those relationships. And so their move to the state level, it, it, they're able to leverage those relationships. And the governor has also just simply set a vision that we need to do better to support school leaders, which is what led to our new school leadership strategic plan, which is really a blueprint for improving and enhancing school leadership across our state. That's great, and I'm gonna turn it over to, to Monica. Thanks, John. I'll turn it over to Monica for the next series of questions. Sure, thank you, Seth. Uh, Commissioner McLean, I have a question for you. Um, and I'm gonna pose a similar question that uh, Seth posed to Secretary Bunting, and that's around uh, the state's efforts to advance school leadership. Can you please talk to us about Tennessee's efforts in this area? Sure. Like what was described in Delaware, um, you know, our governor fundamentally believes that the school principal is the key to ensuring continued progress in our state. And, and we've seen that in our own experiences over the last eight years. 
where we've made some dramatic changes and shifts, as many states have, in the level of expectations, um, accountability around those expectations, uh, changes that have uh, required, really, a school leader to take on additional visioning and support and identification of resources. And as all of those changes have occurred, you know, there has been a defining moment where we've seen where strong school principals were leading that work, we are getting dramatically different results. And so knowing that the school principal is that key inside the building, we know that um, we, we knew that we had to do some things to support principals in a very uh, specific and pragmatic way. So the governor really started several years ago with something called GASL. It's the Governor's Aspiring School Leaders Program, but because we love acronyms, of course, we, we shorten that to GASL. But the Aspiring mm -hmm. School Leaders Program really targets assistant principals in the state. Um, it's a program where we partnered with Vanderbilt University as well as um, a partnership with the State Department and our school districts to identify high-performing um, folks who are current assistant principals that may not have access to strong aspiring leaders programming in rural parts of our state. And we're bringing them together for over a year in a cohort where they um, are working toward um, really what I would consider transformational leadership competencies and an understanding of what um, the focus is and vision is in the state, while at the same time having a mentor who is in most likely a neighboring district to where they currently work where they're getting release time and working directly with that mentor um, who's also high quality inside their schools and, and districts. So that's where we started. And we have now, we're now in our fourth cohort of very strong aspiring school leaders. And I'm happy to say we have well over about 52% of the folks who've come to that program are now in a principal role um, in those first two cohorts. And then the last cohort we just finished that's around 30 something percent have already been advanced into a principal role. So we're really trying to target a problem we think we can solve, which is if we need about 260 new principals a year, can we solve that by putting out groups of principals um, who can take on that work under these transformational competencies? And then the last thing I would add, you know, we learned a lot from that program, but we knew there was more to do. And so the governor announced back in March a three-tiered transforming school leadership initiative and, and was able to put about three and a half million dollars into initiatives that really target three areas. The, the first is targeting uh, rural principals that are currently serving as principals. The second is how do we continue to think about principal preparation. And the third is targeting uh, retention and recruitment bonuses for principals in our turnaround schools. And so I'll stop there, but those are three pieces that I'm happy to talk more about later. Thanks. That's huge. Thank you so much. Uh, Secretary Bunting, how has Delaware used ESSA as a vehicle for improving school leadership? I think that uh, reflects my philosophy that I shared earlier. I truly believe in the um, the experience and the the background, the development of that that school leader, and so I came into this position when ESSA for Delaware was almost a completed plan. I came in at the end of January. We submitted April 1st, but we've been able to take what was there and use it to maximize uh, some of the experiences that we have uh, using ESSA as a vehicle. For one thing, we've been really um, accenting the flexibility that is in the law and allowing districts to have with responsibility comes uh, with flexibility comes responsibility so we've been urging them to think about how ESSA gives them the the autonomy to do what's best for their individual districts uh, and that uh, is something that's woven into our programs across the state. We know that there can't be a one-size-fits-all approach to this, that it has to be customized. Candace mentioned rural uh, principalships, for example. We have, in a small state of this size with less than 100 miles top to bottom, you have one single city <laughs> and you have a lot of rural. <laughs> and the demographics in Delaware vary greatly. So you really do have to look at the the local context for the kinds of development uh, that you have to design for leaders. And 
therein comes the need for the collaboration and the sharing and the the job alike conversation. So we've been able to use ESSA um, in a variety of ways. Our Title II money that would be associated with our federal monies is almost, um, well, a huge amount of that is being invested in leaders because we recognize the impact that leadership has on student improvement. So uh, we, we've been flexible, we've been creative with our ESSA plans. And even in the reorganization, John mentioned that we have become a support agency. That blends right into the whole philosophy of ESSA and how we're here to support and nurture and grow, though we hold them accountable for what it is that we know we have to accomplish for the sake of students. Thank you. Seth? All right, thanks, Monica. And uh, Commissioner McQueen, turning to you, uh, you mentioned briefly both ESSA and using it for school leadership as well as the rural uh, principal shifts. If we could delve a little deeper on, on both, how are you uh, approaching leadership development and support in rural counties in your state? Sure. Well, under ESSA, we did use um, Title II set-aside funding to specifically focus on all of these transforming leadership initiatives. and. Specifically, um, we identified support for our current rural principals as an area of focus. Um, we offer multiple avenues for leadership training from our uh, sort of signature conference we have every year, uh, which is literally called LEAD, and it brings people together to Nashville for multiple days focused on um, lots of the initiatives in the state, but specifically, you know, supporting their own leadership development. And what we realized is that we were struggling to get a lot of our principals from uh, many rural counties there because of sheer cost. Uh, coming to Nashville, paying for the conference, paying for the lodging, um, and being away from the building was just a challenge for a, a small district. So. Um, part of our rural network that we just announced, um, goodness, a few months ago, we now have 52 principals that are part of this um, inaugural class. They did have to apply and, and specifically be selected. But our goal is to have them take advantage of leadership development opportunities they may not have otherwise been able to do. So they will come to all of our core uh, signature uh, programming um, free of charge. And in addition, they're part of a network that meets now periodically throughout the year. Um, I had an opportunity to meet with them just a few weeks ago, and um, the, the idea is to put in front of them national and state leaders and a specific um, a vision components of our work and have them dig in together on how they can do uh, what we're asking in their rural counties. The rural network really also allows for a lot of exchange of ideas and strategies, uh, a safe place to talk about common challenges with peers that are in that network, and, and talking about things that are just unique um, to our rural areas. Particularly, we, we spent a lot of time in our first meeting talking about the recruitment of teachers and, and sort of grow your own strategies that we're seeing work across the country. So this opportunity is, is really a community of practice, um, and honestly, just designating this work and holding it up and saying rural principals have some unique challenges has been, um, you know, such a strong first uh, dive into this work. We've had so many folks um, say, just thank you for recognizing this as a need and then putting some money behind it and then just getting us together and prioritizing it for the state. So we're excited about what this is going to continue to become and how we can do this for, for many years to come in our state and continue to learn about it. Thank you, Commissioner. And sticking with you just for, for a few minutes, um, one of the pieces we've always found that works best in, in states is when uh, commissioners and governors, and particularly in the relationship between the states and the, uh, the state and the district, that there's clear roles and between the developing and the implementing um, and that there's an empowerment from the governor in providing that space, the conditions, the environment for the work to, to move forward. If you could talk a little bit about how you've designated the roles in, in Tennessee along those lines. Right. Well, like Secretary Bunting was, was noting, uh, you know, I came in with this uh, governor, Governor Haslam's second term. and. There was a real desire by Governor Haslam to do more in the leadership space as well as just teacher prep generally. 
um, as we were continuing to do a lot of other work that we already started. And so there was a specific role that I think he felt like I could serve in to elevate what we were doing on leader and teacher prep. And so the way we really designated our work, and it, and it is something I would recommend to other states, is we said, all right, the department is going to be focused on what does the research say? What does your data show? What are the priorities that we need to be setting around preparing new leaders? Um, you design, you determine what that looks like. And so we began with the task force of individuals we felt like could really weigh into that question and presented data that we had uh, while and identified data we didn't have to say this is what we know about leadership preparation in our state. Then the governor's office really took what we um, what we determined what the task force said would be priorities and they began to set a vision and convened people that were outside of really the practitioner group of funders, philanthropists in our state, folks who um, are part of some of our statewide advocacy and said, all right, if we want to do this well, this is what we know our priorities from the practitioners. How might we think about a private-public partnership to um, design this work going forward? And so the partners then um, that he brought together then set on um, a, a small group. We called it a learning circle. I was part of that too and brought sort of the task force ideas. And um, we worked together to determine these three buckets that I mentioned earlier, the rural network, the additional funding for principals um, in our turnaround uh, schools, and then some very specific funding for these transformational leadership programs that are primarily housed in our um, higher education institutions. And ultimately, they came together with some private funding that's also supporting this work. And finally, I would not want to um, underplay how important the district partnerships have been. While individuals from districts, primarily superintendents and principals, were sitting on some of these task force and the learning circle, honestly, their investment has uh, been the most important. They've said, I'm going to give release time. I'm going to prioritize this with funding on my end. I'm going to take the time to identify folks who will be available and ready to take on leadership work in my district. And so those partnerships were multi-layered and we really spelled out what every group did. What's the State Department doing? What's the governor's office doing? Who are, what are our partners doing and who needs to convene them? And we work directly with districts on the what I would consider the more practical side of how will we make this work. Um, spelling that out and being really clear about people's roles has been one of the reasons why we've had success and, and one reason why I think we will create some sustainability even through these notorial changes. Thank you, Commissioner. That's really helpful. Um, and thank you for sharing that. So, John, similar question to you. How have you designated the roles of developing and implementing between the governor's office and the Department of Education between states and district? And particularly, how has the governor created the space, the conditions, the environment for this work to move forward successfully? Yeah, so, so uh, as I alluded to in the, the first answer, the governor came on and set elevating school leadership as, as a very high priority and also asked that Secretary Bunting reorganize the department and turn it really into a, an on-the-ground support agency uh, that is able to be there for districts and be there for schools. So the governor sort of set the uh, broad goal at the top and, and our Department of Ed sort of puts the meat on the bones, if you will, and, and implements the work. Um, State and, and district relations, as Commissioner McQueen just said, are absolutely critical in making sure that we have the buy-in of the district. And one of the ways that we've been able to really nurture and foster that is by bringing on a new diverse leadership team that has folks like Secretary Bunting, who is very successful in the southern part of our state. We have uh, Christine Alowitz, who's our new deputy secretary, who is an instructional leader and curriculum specialist in the middle part of our state. We have someone, Darrell Green, who leads our turnaround efforts, who is a successful administrator in the northern part of our state. We have a principal from all the way down in, at the bottom of Sussex County, and we have a principal from a charter school in the middle of our state, and we also have a former CFO from a district. And in addition to that, we've brought in national talent, but getting people who districts know and admire and respect at the state level has helped us to form really strong relationships, and, and that makes the work a lot smoother and easier because these are known quantities. These are folks who, who have those relationships on the ground. Uh, we also have worked really closely with districts through uh, our new 
uh, school leadership plan where we're implementing a principal supervisor collaborative. So the state uh, in that support agency role has heard that principal supervisors at the district level would like a little more support in, in the feedback that they give. So we've really made that a key part of this new plan is making sure that our school school leadership supervisors, principal supervisors have the tools they need to provide feedback to school leaders, which is a sometimes a, a, a difficult task, but couldn't be more important. Um, the governor also meets at least twice a year with all the superintendents, sort of leveraging the size of our state. Uh, so we're able to hear from them and speak with them about what's going on sort of at, at their level, at the LEA level. Um, at the, the school level, is a little tougher, but uh, one of the things that we've done is that we have an advisory council of school leaders. So we're able to hear directly from the folks on the ground about what they need, uh, what, what they're doing. And that's been very empowering for them to have that voice uh, because it, it, it matters that we're not just making policy from the state capital and hoping that it's what folks need, but actually hearing from them and being able to respond. I think all of that is is pretty transferable. I think the one thing we do that may not be transferable to, to most people on the call, but if you're in a small state, it certainly is, is we really leverage the size of our state. We only have somewhere in the range of 235 schools, so 235 principals, and uh, Secretary Bunding visited well over 100 schools last year. The governor visited dozens, so we're able to be in like half of our schools each year, and that means walking the building with the principal and hearing directly from them. The governor asks each and every principal we meet with, where would you put your next dollar? If I could help you, what would you what would you want? What can we do to support you? Which is incredibly empowering uh, when you have the governor who helps set the budget next to you asking for your feedback. So that's been really, I think, transformative for a lot of folks and has been enlightening to us uh, in looking to empower leaders to, to really hear on the ground what they need and try and provide that support. That's great, Sean, and I think it really speaks to, we're hearing all panelists talk about this importance of the appointment power, um, and, I, and I think you're, you're also bringing up another really great governor and state lens, state department commissioner lens of being able to really keep up opportunities for regular communication with those district and school leaders to really have a sense of what's happening on the ground and in classrooms and schools, so thank you. I'm going to turn it over to, to Monica now for another next series of questions. Thank you, sir. Uh, this question is for Secretary uh, Bunting and Commissioner McQueen, and I'll ask Secretary Bunting to respond first. Um, but we know how important stakeholder engagement has been in all of your efforts uh, related to school leadership work. Um, I'm curious about how you were able to galvanize, galvanize support um, more broadly from your educators in general in the state for prioritizing school leadership. I believe a lot of that has to do with the connections, the collaboration that we accent in Delaware, uh, beginning, for example, with um, our plan, our ESSA plan was developed by an ESSA advisory committee. So we have, we've involved people from the, from the ranks, the people who know what's happening uh, directly with students in so many things. We have a committee of practitioners that's still guiding work we have next week uh, beginning a group of um, representatives from throughout the state that will be actually contributing to a major uh, plan, a huge initiative to increase accurate grade reading proficiency. So we, every chance we get, bring people from the various districts. We want uh, diversity. We we spread things out. We only have three counties, uh, so we always make sure that we have <laughs> we have representative representatives from each county, but our legislators participate and our school people participate and our, um, our, our people who are out as community members uh, that could be parents or not, but they're stakeholders. So they are very supportive and we bring them in to have uh, community conversations, for example. We recently have taken our report card to multiple areas in the state, our, the one that will come out in December. Uh, we have asked what parents want to see on that report card. So it's um, a convenient uh, way of communicating quickly with our folks. We have neighborhood meetings most recently. We've done it with school financing, and we've just held meetings throughout the state. But we have frequent involvement with a variety of people from districts as well. Uh, I have a personnel director's uh, advisory committee, and we meet with business managers as an advisory committee, and we meet with superintendents as an advisory committee. 
and we also have our curriculum people coming in. So all the input that we can get from our um, our, our agents, I call them my ambassadors out there, uh, coming in to give us as much information as we can possibly get. So we believe in our stakeholders that are involved with buildings, but also our stakeholders who are members of the community. And we often find that by having conversations, by presenting what we envision and then having them contribute to that plan and also being able to critique it. They come back sometimes with not so favorable information, but that helps us to make the plan and the initiatives better for our students. And that's what we're all aiming to achieve. So the, I, I find the collaboration and the communication are key. And if you have the, the opportunity to educate, you often can then find people asking questions that will bring them into the fold. Uh, often opposition is lack of information and lack of understanding. So interaction with our stakeholders at all levels is critical to success in Delaware. Thank you. Commissioner McQueen? I, I would add um, really the, the multiple layers of groups that we had advising us on our work has been critical from uh, we started with this transformational leadership task force uh, we had primarily folks that were internal to Tennessee serving on the task force but we also brought in um, some national individuals um, who have worked on leadership in other states or who have advised generally on leadership programming for other states and so that group worked um, several months to come to what we call our eight core components of the transformational leadership competencies. And that then was the foundation for the decisions we made on some of our, our programming and, and what we would fund and what we would not. Then coming out of that task force, we developed two um, teams. We had a design team and an implementation team for this transformational um, leadership alliance that we were putting together. And those those teams work on different things. One is a bit more of a, a steering committee, um, the which is the design team. And the other is how are we going to ensure that this work is being owned and understood and implemented well on the ground. And um, we have a statewide collaborative on our state called SCORE, the Statewide Collaborative on Reforming Education. They became a critical partner for us in sharing what came out of the transformational leadership work um, as well as um, they're an entity who has prioritized school leadership in our state in their own key priorities um, and annual reports that they put out every year. So they were able to also elevate this work through their um, advocacy avenues. And then finally, we've had groups of superintendents advising us on each piece. So for, for example, we have a group of superintendents who specifically advise us on the rural uh, principal network. What does it look like? What should it entail? How do we know if it's working? Um, and what are the pieces that, quite frankly, the State Department just doesn't know um, that we need to know about on the ground work? So um, at every level, we had a variety of stakeholder groups that were representative of the people that are doing this work in the field and also the advocacy partners. And, and we even had legislators serving with us on, on one of our task force. And that helped some buy-in when you go back to the state legislature and uh, potentially ask for, for budgetary funds as well. Thank you. So I'm going to hand it back over to you. All right, thanks, Monica. And panelists, now we're going to switch a little bit to talk about impact. Um, and it'll be the same question to Secretary Bunting and Commissioner McQueen. How are you measuring the success of these initiatives? What metrics are you using to determine success? Uh, we'll go first to Secretary Bunting. We actually have an official evaluation system for our school leaders if you want to go that route. Uh, we do extensive training so that our superintendents, for example, know how to look for the promising practices among uh, our principals and, uh, and coach them. Um, and principals are taught to do that with their assistant principals. So if you're looking for that kind of evaluation, we do have that in place. Frankly, the measure of success that's the ultimate measure is the success of our students. And that's what we're really trying to, um, to work toward. If you talk to our governor, he'll, he'll emphasize the three things that he's most concerned about. And that's an increase in third grade reading proficiency, an eighth grade math proficiency, and an increase in our graduation rate with our graduates truly being ready for the future, as opposed to just somehow 
accumulating course credits and, and being finished with school. So he wants, uh, he's very interested in preparing them for careers as well as for, as for college. So those are, are some of the, um, the measures, the official ones. But we have a Delaware School Success Framework that is used on all of our schools. And the indicators on the framework go beyond just student proficiency and student growth. Uh, they do look at graduation rate for high schools. They do take a look at, for example, chronic absenteeism, because we know how that impacts learning. So we do have an official uh, school success framework. Uh, we are just going through the process now of identifying our schools that will be comprehensive school uh, comprehensive support and improvement schools, and then the uh, targeted support and improvement schools. And we have plans that have you know, extensive plans for helping those particular schools. But there are other ways to look at leadership success as well. Uh, you have satisfaction surveys that we do at various times. We at times have done a statewide survey of how people feel about our schools. We also have that pipeline that we're trying to uh, to fill with very well qualified administrators. And frankly, the length of time, first of all, do they gain employment here in Delaware? We're hoping they do after we've tried to go through the process of preparing them for it. And then how long do they stay in those roles? Because we know that we have a great deal of work to do once they are identified as building leaders. And how do we help them continue that growth and um, be enticed enough to stay long term as opposed to burning out, for example. So just the statistics on the hiring and the retention of those uh, folks that we've worked so hard. Plus, I think staff re retention in a school tells you a lot about the administrator's effectiveness. That's great. Thank, thank you, Secretary Bunting. A multiple um, areas it sounds like of, of educator and student impact that you're looking at um same question to you commissioner mcqueen yeah I'll, i will just add um you know i would agree with um everything that secretary bunting just said we have a, a version of almost everything that she described I, I would add maybe on the very specific initiative like how are we trying to monitor and measure outcomes and success on those initiatives. Uh, an example is on our um, Tennessee Transformational Leadership Alliance. So these are nine programs that have adopted these uh, leadership competencies that we have identified, that they are doing more clinical work, there's a different level of engagement on mentorship, um, and, and the expectations are very different um, throughout the program in terms of outcomes. Who are you bringing in and, and what are your outcomes? We have um, a, what I would consider a, a pretty extensive site visit and set of metrics that actually monitor, one, who we choose to be one of these programs, and then, two, uh, what the outcomes need to look like um, for continued support from the state. So that's a, that's a team of people. It's a small team of people who actually are visiting and monitoring those programs that's part of this multi-tiered um, process. And if folks are not measuring up in terms of the outcomes that are requested, that could be anywhere from they they don't have the appropriate mentors that have been described. They don't have the level of clinical um, experiences that we require. They don't have the competencies developed well with assessments um, developed throughout that program. You know, any, any piece of that, then they would not have the ability to move forward with our next level of funding for support. Um, in an ongoing fashion. And then the other the other thing that I would mention as an addition is we have a, a research partnership with um, Peabody College called the Tennessee Education Research Alliance. And that group um, actually has a researcher named Jason Grissom who does a lot of research nationally on mm -hmm. school leadership. But they are also uh, looking at our initiatives and our programs and success yeah. over time. So beyond what we would consider as our individual metrics around the initiative, what does this look like over three, five, you know, eight years? And did the work that we start actually have some long-term benefit? And then we hope that that just adds to the field of knowledge we have about school leadership. I I'm a believer there's still so much more to know about what's the state's role? How do we work um, seamlessly to help 
support school leaders. Um, a, a lot of things I think you can do on the ground in districts, but what, where should we really be putting our emphasis and what are the levers of the state? And I think we have a lot of work to, to do as a country to add more research to that body of knowledge. And so we're attempting to do that as well as we think about um, the large picture research and researchers that are using really our approaches to, to measure and monitor over the, the coming years. Thank you, Commissioner. I really like that research and evaluation component, almost setting up a, a system of continuous cycle of improvement um, and really to inform the work going forward. So that's a great, great point. Uh, I'll turn it over back to, to Monica for the next series. Sure. Um, this question is for Commissioner McQueen and Secretary Bunting, and I'll ask Commissioner McQueen to start us off with the response. But the question is, how, have, how has the state ensured that your school leadership initiatives um, have aligned with other educated development and support uh, being implemented in the state? You know, I, I think this is an area of uh, growth for us. Um, so, candidly, I think we've done um, a lot of pieces well on the alignment front and how we think about standards and assessment and accountability. But how do you plug in the leadership piece where there's alignment across all of your initiatives has been an area that we've identified as an area of growth to the point where we're bringing a lot of our partners across the department into, uh, and I'm talking about from our different divisions, into the same room to say, you are training uh, principals on this, and you're training principals on this, and this group's training principals on this. Here are what we're we are um, elevating as our principal evaluation system. This is what we've elevated as our core competencies. How does this all align through all the trainings we do, whether it's on response to intervention or whether it's about you know adverse childhood experiences or whether it's about college and career readiness? How do we ensure that the principal training um, actually speaks all the same language and is aligned? Um, we started that by um, in two ways. We we begin um, every year in terms of our planning for the following year by identifying what are our top three areas of emphasis, and then those are the strands. And typically, they're carryover from the year before, but we may refine it more. Those are the strands that run throughout all of the training that we do, and it's very clear that these are going to be the areas of focus for everything from the superintendents to the principals to what we do with teachers. And if there are things that are extraneous to that, um, we, we either don't do it, which we're getting a lot better at saying no to things and no, we're not going to do that, or we're going to put that in a different um, uh, level of, of training, one that is truly optional. And uh, the place where that has been the most impactful is we, we do um, – we have worked across the state through our core offices. We, we support eight offices through um, uh, the Department of Education that sit in different regions. And these eight offices have six people. And these six people have very specific um, SMART goals that they are um, implementing every year to support the you know 19 to 20 districts that they support in their particular region. And we've ensured that the regional core offices actually are all focused on the same things we are um, at the main office in Nashville, and that means that the leaders that are in those core regions need to be trained on all of those focus areas. So that has been our first attempt. I actually think there's a lot more work to be done on that, but alignment in a large state with a million students, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of principals that you're trying to get on the same page starts with lots of focus in terms of vision. It starts with how you figure out what you're going to do for the year and how you align it. And then you begin to see the district starting to um, think about their alignment as well um, on the ground um, by working with our core offices. Um, so that's how we've started that work. Um, but I, I'm loving learning from other states and how we can continue to do that better. Okay. I'm going that's to great. Thank you. I'm going to echo many of those initiatives, but scale to bring it to scale, and I'm going to bring it to small scale. <laughs> so as we re reorganize our department, we do not have any regions. We deal directly with, with the districts, but we had that idea of aligning whatever we could possibly align with um, all the foci of the state and uh, what we needed to be doing with our ESSA plan 
So we, in our re a reorganization of the department, created uh, the deputy secretary position as one that would oversee our educator support team, our academic support team, and our student support team. And part of that student support team is the school improvement or the school support team. So these three people or these three associate secretaries are constantly meeting with our deputy to assure that our efforts are as aligned as they possibly can be. I keep in close contact, of course, with the deputy. And so through that, um, that juncture, really, of our three associate secretaries and those teams that never before have had communication literally with one another, we're hoping to make sure that much more of that alignment and uh, all of our initiatives are, are connected. Um, and we also, during cabinet meetings, for example, have a great deal of discussion so that even our broader cabinet with the operations piece added in and our early childhood uh, office and our office of innovation, we're hearing what's happening in those other three areas. So we spend a lot of time communicating and collaborating in an effort to make sure we're as aligned as humanly possible. Thank you so much. And then the, the, the next question, um, and I'll ask you, Susan, to kick us off. And John, uh, if you'd like to respond, I'd like to hear from you as well. And then Candace, where do you see this work headed next? And, and what are you most excited about? I'm simply excited about leadership development and where we're going. We have a grand plan, and we're just taking the first steps toward that plan. I see it. Uh, I see it growing and growing steadily. Um, speaking of collaboration, we're collaborating also with the School Board Association and the Principals Association here in the state, and we're actually doing joint uh, professional development. So the idea that we can make our network even tighter between various organizations, we're even uh, collaborating with our teachers union on training. A lot of the social and emotional learning that's going on in the state right now is being duly sponsored uh, by the Department of Education and the Delaware, uh, you know, the State Educators Association, which is a unique um, combination, but it's, it's working very nicely. So I'm excited about the potential of seeing so many of our educators or educationally related groups uh, working toward common goals, and I think that is uh, is really energizing. So that's one thing that excites me. I know there are challenges, but I find that piece extremely, um, extremely powerful as to what can happen for students in the state of Delaware. And we only have 139,000, not a million, <laughs> but we're, we're really working <laughs> to get to each one of those. That is exciting. Thank you. John, did you want to add anything to that? Yes, the Secretary Bunting uh, covered the, the school leadership strategic plan. We really do have the right game plan, and we just sort of need to go out and, and execute. And, and we have uh, data that we absolutely need to turn around. For instance, about 28% of our schools keep the same principal for five years. Um, that's, that has to, to be improved because we cannot see sort of the, the change that we need for students if we continue to have such high turnover rates. And 20% um, of our principals in high need schools turn over every year. That, that's not going to lead to the gains that we need to see for children. Uh, so we need to get this right. And I think what I'm most excited about is seeing those third grade scores improve, seeing those eighth grade math scores improve, seeing more of our students graduating ready for college and career, because that's, that's sort of what we need to measure ourselves by. Are we doing right by children? And I think if we get this right, then, then we'll, we'll see that play out. Thank you, John. Commissioner McQueen? Yeah, I, I would echo this idea of uh, getting the implementation right. I mean, we started um, multiple initiatives even within 2018, and so we want to um, have strong implementation, strong partnership, um, strong um, feedback loops, whether that's from your data and what you're gathering or from the folks that are involved, uh, specifically as we keep getting better and better at the work of supporting principals. I think what I would be, um, you know, remiss if I didn't say, I mean, I, I am certainly most excited about seeing other states uh, pick up the mantle of school leadership and us continuing to push on each other to get better. Uh, the more and more that we focus in this area, the more we're going to learn about what works. And 
we have too many schools that are in, a, a, we call it priority status, those comprehensive support schools, and we need exceptional principals that we have helped prepared correctly, then supported the right way, and then retained the right way. And so we're really looking to learn from all of our, um, our partner states on how do we keep pushing each other to get better data, better results, um, and learn from these outcomes, whether they're good or bad, and be very honest about what we're learning so we can um, truly have exceptional leaders in every single school, particularly the schools that need it the most. And so I'm excited about how we've elevated, I think, as a, as a a country really the idea of school leadership now we've got to execute on some work and see what we can learn from each other that is energizing thank you Seth thanks Monica and I have one more question but I think given the time I'm going to pause and just uh, let's open it up to any of the participant Q&A for our panelists so just to remind you um, when, now that we've opened it up, you can use the raise hand feature and we'll unmute you. Um, type your questions in the question box or email education at nga.org your question and we'll, we'll open it up. Okay. Well, we'll give it a few minutes and I'll, I'll go ahead and ask the, the question. Um, so, as we as we end up the, the conversation, what challenges and lessons learned of developing and implementing these initiatives have you seen? If you were a, a governor or a commissioner um, getting started tomorrow on this kind of work, what would you have wanted to know uh, before you got started? And we'll go down the line to all of you, and we'll start with Secretary Bunting. One thing that I think you have to recognize is that time is a precious commodity. And as you plan these programs, we have to be flexible if school leaders are to convince themselves that they have schedules that will allow them to do their jobs and to continue growing. Many of them are selfless, and so they would talk themselves out of being out of buildings, even though they would know the, the profit uh, in being out. They are often so devoted to what's happening or feel so drawn by what's happening on the home front. So one. One thing I would recognize is the time and how that means that we need to be creative in scheduling of sessions, which will help our leaders to grow. Uh, I also would, um, from the beginning, recognize that one size does not fit all. And so uh, we've mentioned the rural principles needing something that's specific to being a rural principal. And that I think is to be concerned, that's a concern no matter where your principles are from. It's going to differ. Um, so we have to, again, customize our trainings to fit the needs of each of the participants and also to recognize that certain leaders have experiences or uh, maybe knowledge levels that, again, require our, our trainings, our experiences to be differentiated to address the specific needs of each individual. And that's a tall order. Thank you, Secretary. John, on to you. Yeah, so I think w one of the challenges is a bit ironic, which is that this isn't like this glimmering new initiative. I think sometimes as a society, we love to see like a new $100 million investment in, in iPads for every student and universal this. And this is not fancy. This is not something that is going to be like eye popping and catch headlines. But this is probably the most important thing we do. If we have a great school leader in every building, that is possibly the number one thing we can do to improve student achievement. So sometimes when people ask, what are you doing in Delaware? And I say, we're focusing on school leadership. Their eyes sort of glaze over, which is such a shame because this, this is the ball game right here. Um, so, so I think getting people to understand that and, and to Commissioner McQueen's point, if we can see other states picking this up, I think that would be incredibly gratifying and also very good for kids. As far as like the things we would want people to know on my end, I think one thing that we keep harping on is getting the right people in, having the right people at your Department of Education. I firmly believe that talent is contagious. And if you get the right diverse leaders, you will bring on more talented leaders and things will be so much better for children. So placing that premium on talent, I think, can't be overstated. I also think just ignoring the noise. I think in, in our world, there's a lot of noise around what we do and a lot of, of criticism at times. And I think that sort of leads into number three, which is that everything we should do has to be with children's best interest in mind. Someone once said at a conference I was at that the problem
promises that we make to children ought to be sacred. And I think that we have to sort of be laser focused on doing what's best for children. And that means putting a great school leader in every building. That means developing a talented pipeline to take those spots. So I really firmly believe that if we just keep our eye on that, that everything will fall into place. And so that would be my, my advice to folks coming into these roles. That's a great point. Thanks. Thanks, John. Talent matters, not just for schools, but for organizations. And so, um, you know, it's a great, great point. Um, Commissioner McQueen. Yeah, I, I would start with what the data tell, told us in Tennessee, and it was number one. Um, we know this nationally. Our Tennessee data shows us the same thing. Highly effective teachers are the number one way we move students and grow students inside our schools. And then the second most important factor is do you have a principal that is also highly effective that is keeping and attracting um, your strongest teachers. And so knowing that, we put a lot, a lot of emphasis on teachers, and, and we should, but the principal component is what I would call that it's the linchpin. It's where everything comes together. Do you have the principal who can own um, own the work, um, talk about the work, uh, really strong at recruiting. Um, they're very good at uh, working with the community. They understand all the components that a strong classroom needs, high quality curriculum. They get what that means. They also understand, you know, social uh, SEL and, and how do you make sure these non-academic and social and emotional needs are met. And they have the ability to prioritize the right things at the right time. And that is a lot for one person to, to do. So my, my advice is to think about school leadership as um, more of a school leadership uh, team where you have an effective principal, but you're also thinking about teacher leadership and teacher work at the same time that's elevating their own leadership roles in the classroom and at the school level. Uh, I think thinking about those two initiatives together actually helps move this uh, further faster. If you're, if you're not thinking about the teacher leadership component, then you don't get um, maybe all the buy-in. It's really hard sometimes to attract all the right principals, but with a strong group of teacher leaders at your school that you've invested in as a principal, the work just becomes more um, m m more possible um, than what you might have otherwise. And, and I would say the last item, and uh, I really think John said this, make sure you have the right people at the State Department of Education leading this work. Um, highly effective people, it sounds like what you've done in Delaware, that are um, respected in their own right. And they're coming into a situation where they are now leading work that folks know they can do. That matters a lot uh, to folks who are in the field. You don't want to listen to somebody who is, you know, a, a second year master's degree student who's never done this work <laughs> before in the field. You want someone who has uh, done the work and is highly respected as they talk about the work um, out, out in the field. And the final thing I would say is uh, stay the course. This is some of the most important work we can be doing. And sometimes, uh, to the points made from Delaware, it may not be the sexiest work or get the front page story, but it's the work that's going to help all of your initial your initiatives and your strategies actually move forward. Um, and it is the work that, at the end of the day, is going to impact student growth. And that's why we're in this profession. That's why we do this work. And, and so I would, I would just keep saying, stay the course and continue to get better at getting better and sharing lessons learned um, across our state. Well, thank you all. And this has been a great conversation. I think it'll be very helpful for our our governor's advisors, and I am sure for uh, the commissioners and, and commissioner staff out there as well, I want to be cognizant of time. And so, um, again, thank you to all our panelists. We greatly appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise with us today. We are recording this webinar, and we'll be sending out a follow-up email from NGA and CCSSO to all of you with a link to the recording and additional Wallace Foundation resources on school leadership. Um, so I think that's it. Oh, if you could, um, any participants on the line, there is a brief survey. If you can make sure to submit your answers before closing out of the go uh, GoToMeeting browser, that would be great. So thanks again and have a great day.